Hello friends, are you sick of this costume yet? Today's agent of deterioration is guaranteed to be illuminating. It's one that's pretty glaring, if I do say so myself. Don't worry, I'm sure you're bright enough to have already figured out what it is. It's light. This agent is one that's filled with dilemmas because without light, there'd be no way for us to see, well, well anything really. But light can also damage and degrade objects quite rapidly. So with this agent of deterioration, we have to compromise and come up with some sort of balance between seeing the artifact and protecting it. Now there are different types of light that can cause different damages to objects. There's regular light, meaning the spectrum of light that is visible, the stuff that makes us see. And then there are two other invisible forms that we need to be aware of, ultraviolet and infrared light. We can't see them, but they can also be really damaging to artworks. And yes, before you start writing this in the comments, visible light sources and light bulbs, or you know, like the sun, can also produce ultraviolet and infrared light. And there's a lot of physics and science that go into talking about photon energies and light particles and light waves and what have you, but I am not a light science expert, so I will only be telling you about the effects various forms of light have on cultural heritage objects. But with that being said, let's get into some introductory science first by looking at the light spectrum. Light is made up of electromagnetic radiation or waves. Different types of light have various types of energy. Let's look at the light spectrum, shall we? On the high end, we've got ultraviolet rays. Ultraviolet light is made up of very short, closely packed together waves. These have more power. After that, we have all the colors of the rainbow. This is the visible light that makes up everything that we can see. As the colors transition to red, the wavelengths get longer, and then we have infrared light on the other end. These three things are what we need to worry about when protecting cultural heritage. These three forms of light have very different damaging effects on objects. Ultraviolet rays have a very high energy and can lead to yellowing and just complete breakdown of materials like adhesives and, and paper. Think about the surfaces of that old lawn furniture that just starts to just flake off, or that yellowy glue that just crumbles when you touch it. UV light just pretty much causes everything to just disintegrate. Visible light, all that stuff in between UV and infrared light, causes fading or bleaching of colors. Some colors can fade within just a few hours, whereas some could take years to become noticeable. Of course, if something is in direct sunlight, it will fade a lot faster in comparison to something in lower museum lighting. I tried to make an example for you guys, but I live in the Netherlands and the sun does not exist here, so I was not able to to, uh, age something as quickly as I wanted to. So here's just a visual example that I found on the internet for you. Another thing that you can think about and probably visualize is that, do you remember when your teacher was changing the board outside your classroom in elementary school and when they would take stuff down, there'd be all these dark shadows of what used to be there and the, the stuff that was exposed was a lot lighter? That's a prime example of fading right there. After UV and visible light, we have infrared light. This type of light wave doesn't have enough energy to cause any photochemistry to happen, so any damage caused by this form of light is actually just due to exposure to heat. Museums don't really use incandescent light bulbs that give off heat anymore, and they're not so big on displaying exhibits in direct sunlight, so a lot of this risk is already diminished. Infrared isn't as important to think about in comparison to UV and visible light, so we won't be focusing on it too much in this video. When dealing with infrared, you just really have to check for the amount of warmth coming out of your light source. You never want to overheat your object because too much heat or keeping an object at the incorrect temperature temperature can also be very damaging to an object, but we'll be getting to that in a later video. Some objects are very sensitive to light, such as newspaper, oil paints, dyed fabrics, inks, and things like that, whereas some are completely immune, like inorganic materials such as stone, metal, and glass. So go ahead and shine all the light that you want on that big unpainted statue, but you best be careful with that reed basket and painted parchment. So if light can cause all this damage, it's obvious then that we'd want to limit the amount of light exposure to an object. For measuring visible light in museums, we use the term lux, which essentially means the light intensity. Lux is a unit of measure to determine how much light is actually hitting an object. When displaying an object, we need to keep lux a priority because the more light we shine on an object, the faster it will degrade. Think about it in terms of if you're heating water at the highest setting on your stove, it'll boil a lot faster in comparison to if you're heating it up on a much lower setting. So increasing the lux means increasing the rate of decay to an object. Well, that's an easy fix, right? Just keep the light levels low. Not really. You see, there's a minimum amount of lux needed for us to be able to see. A good base level to go off of is 
50 lux. That's enough for a well-functioning human eye to see full color vision. Let's call that reasonable visibility. 50 lux is still a bit dark for everyone's liking though. If we want to be able to see dark surfaces better, you need to multiply 50 lux by a factor of three. If you want to see more contrast, add another factor of three. And if you want to see really fine detail, add another factor of three. And if you're older, you guessed it, another factor of three. The thing is, not everyone has perfect eyesight. And as we age, our ability to see in low light situations really diminishes. That means if we also want our older populations to enjoy museums, we need to do these sorts of calculations to figure out what the most acceptable level of light is. Again, it's all about that balance and compromise. It's something that's a big part of exhibition design and museum display. You might see people walking around with light meters to check the amount of light that's hitting an object. This is to make sure the lights are at the correct level in accordance to the type of object that they are illuminating. Museums calculate the total light exposure on a surface in something called megalux hours by measuring the light intensity and the number of hours that the object will be exposed to it. If we're using what we've already learned, a higher lux will create more damage per hour than a lower lux. Given that, museums calculate what the acceptable lux would be for the maximum amount of exhibition time. This is why you see a lot of rotation in museums because objects can only be on display for a certain amount of time before they need to go back back into storage. They reach an acceptable level of fade, then are put away so they can come out again in the future. It's also why they turn the pages of books that are on display. This way there's an equal amount of fade over all of the pages, so that way it doesn't degrade unevenly. Another thing we want to limit is exposure to direct light. Indirect light is best, so that way the beams aren't solely concentrated on one part of the object. Natural light is also very hard to control. I'm pointing to my window, you don't see it. So that's why you notice that in museums, natural light is very limited. The actual light source itself is also a big factor in museums. Fluorescent lights and sunlight both give off UV rays. Fluorescent lights less so, but we're talking more of a cumulative process because light degradation doesn't happen immediately. Halogen lamps, while they don't have UV, they do get super hot and that's not so good either. So if all of those are bad options, then what are we supposed to use? LED lights are really great because they're bright, but they don't get hot and they don't have as much UV as fluorescent lights do. Fiber optic lights are excellent for the museum environment because they don't produce any heat and have very minimal ultraviolet. They are expensive, but they'll save your object and the planet because they do also reduce carbon emissions. And if you're thinking of the same fiber optic lights I first imagined when I heard about these guys, congratulations, you're officially old. Another way to combat all of these light rays shooting at an object is to put UV filters on your windows and exhibition cases. Or just make sure that your sensitive artifacts aren't in an area that's exposed to a lot of uncontrollable light. Something that I've seen in a few museums, including my favorite one, the ROM in Toronto, if you had to guess, is light reduction using motion sensors. It means that some objects that are very sensitive to light, like painted wood and mummies, are placed in a corner with very low light. But if there isn't anyone around for a certain amount of time, the lights go off so as to not expose the object to any more unnecessary light hours. I think it's a genius idea. And you also feel super cool walking into a dim corner of a museum because it's like you're the first person discovering it. So the next time you find yourself complaining that the museum you're in is too dark, remember that there is a method to our madness and it's all for the greater good. There you have it friends, light. An agent of deterioration that we just have to live with because without it, we'd be stuck feeling around in the dark. If you liked that video, go ahead and smash that like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on all the other agents of deterioration. Big thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you like the channel and you want to support it, go on over to Patreon and become a patron. The link is in my description below. Here are all of my socials and I'll see you all back here three days from now for the next agent of deterioration. Stay dirty, my friends.